everyone. Welcome to Let's Get Literary. Today, we'll be sitting down with Robert F. DeFinis, author of How to Defeat the Icky, Filthy, Creepy, Slimy Corona Monster. Sometimes as parents, it's hard to explain what's happening in the world, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll learn a little bit about how we can teach our children to stay safe, stay healthy, protect themselves and those around them. Hi there, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you, and I am very excited to learn a little bit about your book, and as a mom, um, learn a little bit about how to teach my kids exactly what's going on. Tell me a little bit about yourself. So um, I'm from uh, just outside of Pennsylvania, uh, just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I have uh, been in education for over 20 years. I have my own consulting business. This is actually my first children's book. Primarily, I've been in academic uh, writing and research, uh, but this is my first uh, stab at a children's book. I have actually, I had been working on two uh, that are due out later this year and early next year. And uh, I have two children, a boy and a girl. Uh, Penelope, she is five, and Robbie, he is 11. So tell me a little bit, you mentioned this is your first children's book that you really kind of, sounds like you sped it up a little bit. Why now? Why was this the time that you kind of said, I'm going to do this now, and I'm going to get this message to parents and children? Sure. So <clears throat> it, it, the book has to do with the coronavirus. So back when this all started to kind of take shape back in uh, early March, mid-March, when things start to, started to shut down a little bit, uh, I was uh, having the conversation with my own children about what was going on. My son, he had just, uh, the school had stopped and uh, was uh, temporarily canceled. And uh, my daughter, you know, he, she had questions about, you know, why we weren't able to see, you know, her grandparents, aunts and uncles and things like that. So I had some important questions that had to be answered from my own children. And uh, one evening we were kind of all just kind of playing on the bed and uh, my son said something uh, and it sparked the Corona monster is going to get, you know, my daughter if she doesn't wash her hands or cover her cough. And out of that, I felt, you know, as an educator, we needed to, um, well, I, I personally wanted to find and be able to provide information to parents and educators. I believe that some of the best things, educational resources, obviously are geared towards children. And I felt that this was the right time. Uh, the book kind of came together within two weeks. Uh, like I said, I had been working on other books and they have been, they've been a slow process because I'm always, you know, I think as a writer, you're, it's hard to give your information out. We want it to be perfect, right? We want the illustration to be perfect. We want the story to be perfect. Um, and I'm not saying that this book isn't perfect. I'm just saying that I think it was very timely. It had to get out. The message was important. Uh, it has been well received. And I just think that parents and educators are looking for good quality information to share with their children. I like how you made it a rhyming book. I thought that was very engaging to the readers, um, to the kids who read it. They kind of get to flow with it. But I also like how you didn't shy away from the serious things. You know, you said how symptoms can be pretty severe and they have to really care about themselves and take care of themselves. I think that as a mom, it's been a struggle trying to teach my children the severity of it without um, scaring them, quite honestly, right? Because you still want them to feel comfortable and you want them not to feel paranoid no matter what they do, but you need to explain to them when you see your friend from a distance, this is why you cannot hug them. You cannot play ball with them just yet. You cannot share a snack with them, you know? And I think that was important. How did your children take this book when you read it to them? So the first, you know, when I first uh, was throwing some, some words together, it wasn't necessarily rhyming. And then it just, it, the reason I went to rhyme, uh, I think it was because mostly children, I want them to be able to put it to memory, right? And when we put rhyme to memory, then we're going to maybe repeat the steps versus just kind of putting words on a page and, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of loses its luster. But I've even found my own children while they're washing their hands, they're talking about grime. And that's a good thing, right? They're rhyming and doing the activity. I would say they, uh, my son, they, I mean, he was, he was very instrumental on it. I think he was, you know, when he said Corona monster, that was like, huh, 
Corona monster. This is a monster, right? This is something that we need to beat and defeat. Uh, so they loved it. And uh, I've teased, they're my, you know, they're my critics too, right? They're going to let me know. They're going to let dad know if this is good or not. And once I, um, once I had some of the verse down, I, uh, I wanted to share it. I wanted to get it out there. I've been doing illustration now not that long, about maybe six to eight years. Uh, I had nothing really ready for this. Uh, there's some things that now looking at it, I would kind of go back and do. So there might be a revision or two. But uh, I'm confident that it really just kind of hit the point. Like I said, it's been well received. Um, you know, and people have been, you know, and that's why I put it out there to the universe as well. Uh, and I'm not shy asking for reviews about it. I want to hear what I can do to get better because I do have two passion projects coming out and I want to make them as best as, uh, as I can do. Have you sent these books to pedi pediatric offices and schools? Where have you targeted or kind of who are, who is your target audience besides me as a mom? Have you been in contact with any other institutions? So it's an, an actually a crazy story. Uh, some of us authors that have written about the coronavirus, we actually had our, so my book was published on August 11th. I'm sorry, April 11th, sorry, April 11th. And immediately, some of us, our books were flagged by Amazon because Amazon developed a quick policy, obviously. They were concerned about uh, bad information getting out there. And my book was immediately flagged. I'll just save you the story, but it took almost a month to get the book approved on Amazon's platform. Now, two weeks in, I realized that it wasn't really getting, a, I wasn't getting a lot of movement from, uh, you know, the, uh, the content reviewers at Amazon. So I decided uh, to go a different path. And I did exactly what you said. I started to contact libraries, institutions, um, uh, early childhood education centers. I mean, any, anywhere and everywhere that I thought this book could find an audience. And to be truthful, I was never out to get or make a dollar on this book. I was really just about getting the information out. Uh, that's how it actually became initially viral, is that I gave it away. And institutions like the National Library of South Africa, they made it available to over 200 of their affiliates. Uh, Books and Home Australia made it available to all their affiliates. So if you, you go on my website, there is probably close to 30 different distributors of the book. And I was perfectly fine with that. And then finally, I, you know, I, I say Amazon kind of came to their senses and they started proving our books. Um, then it took off on Amazon. Uh, I think right now, the last I checked on the platforms that I monitor, it's close to 22,000 downloads, uh, maybe just uh, shy of 3,000 sales. That's fine. It's great. It's getting out there. The resource is becoming available. I also, one other thing that I did that I thought was very important, and I did it this morning, is virtual read-alouds. Um, I had uh, three kindergarten classes today from Southwest Philadelphia online today, reading to them as in one of their last days of school and talking about the coronavirus. So the more I can get this information out, the better I feel, because it's just a good message. What were some of the questions that the kindergartners asked you today? So I actually made the book also into an activity book. So I made it, um, I took the book, made it an activity book with guided questions at the bottom. And then also you can color in it. So you can color and use the questions. And uh, so we would, um, we were doing like a little bit of popcorn reading and going back and forth. It was amazing. I mean, listening to, I was a little worried. And I, when I first wrote the book, I put some, you know, I, I put some, Big words in there, you know, persistence. I, and, you know, I saw, yeah, yeah. You know, and, some, and I got feedback and people were like, you know, maybe that's a little bit too high. I said, you know what, that's going to stop and they're going to ask questions and that's what we want. What does persistence mean, right? So they're good benchmarks with inside of the book to stop and talk about these things. And um, the, the, the kids were amazing. I was blown away by their, you know, understanding of like social distance. That's a new concept for a lot of us, right? You know, we may have understood what social distance was, but this is a whole nother concept that we're introducing to children. And uh, it was really interesting to hear their perception of that. Uh, another part that I found really cool was one of the little girls was talking about how she couldn't wait to, to get back to hugging, you know? 
and missing hugging. And it was such a small part of the book, but yet to her, she's like, we don't, if you think about it, when we teach kids, we, kids are social interactors, right? We kind of get close to them in proximity. And she was just, you know, she was like, I, I can't wait to hug again, hug my friends, hug my grandparents. And that kind of, um, you know, that resonated with me. It's funny you say that my mother comes over now at a distance, of course, and we were playing bingo. Hindi's libraries ran a bingo the other night. And my daughter's sitting on one end of the table I'm on, my mother's sitting where I am. And she just looks at my mom and she goes, can't wait to hug you again. Yeah. And it's, it's just these things that you, you took for granted. And now because we're breaking everything down and we're telling them what you can and can't do, they're really understanding and they're really feeling that loss of social interaction. And I think your book kind of helps them understand why. And so it's very important for him to have a tool for him. You know, we read the news and we read CDC guidelines, but he needs something that he can kind of comprehend. And I think this was really awesome. Uh, about three weeks ago, I was starting to notice because again, Amazon was approving new books and uh, we're starting to see additional authors take the space, which is amazing. Um, I started to see a variety of children's books that uh, t uh, tackled different aspects of what's going on. So I started to reach out to some of the other authors and uh, there's 20 of us now and we developed a, um, uh, a group. Uh, we call it, um, you know, authors fighting COVID-19. And uh, we're just kind of doing our, to, uh, collaborative promotions together to get our books read together because my philosophy is if you're going to read my book, why not read a half a dozen other books that talk about somewhat some similar some similarity within the in the subject, but they also talk about other things that I didn't consider as a, as an author, and uh, so it's pretty cool because you know we kind of banded together and there there's about twenty different authors that I'm working with right now to do some side projects to get our books in front of children. And you said it best: what my book may resonate or it may not resonate with a, with a child, but over here. There's another, there's another source. There's another material. There's another way to tell the story. And I think that that's really cool. So we don't shy away from promoting other authors. And, and another thing is, you know, this week, some of us, we've taken a little bit of a, you know, a backseat to promoting our book because there are other issues in the forefront. And we are supporting other authors that are talking about other, you know, other things that aren't related to COVID-19, like race relations and the importance of being good neighbors and things like that. So, you know, as a community, authors kind of just, you know, we come forward, we step to the side, we step backwards, we support each other in all of this. And I think that that's also very important to do. You know, I've been, um, we've been interviewing about half a dozen so far in our podcast, and everyone kind of feels the same way you do. You know, they all feel like they're part of this big team, this big community. And even though they don't know each other personally, they formed a bond, whether they met at a conference or at a workshop or on social media. There's now this band of brothers, so to say, and sisters yeah. um, that are working together as a team. And I find when I hear that, it, it really speaks to me because, you know, when we began our nonprofit, um, there's just two of us running the show. Um, and when we began, we didn't really know what we were doing. We were forming very organically and people from all different circles started reaching out to us, local organizations, organizations overseas. Um, and at first we were kind of like, wait, are these competitors? What's happening? And then we realized, you know, we're just trying to get books into the hands of children. And if we can reach children in this part of the community or the country, and there's another group that's working with children in Asia or Africa or Canada, um, someone from Honduras emailed me, why not work together? And I think that's very important now, especially like you said, right now, yeah. working together and being part of a big team is something people I think are just lacking and missing out. And I think that, you know, these messages that you spread, that your fellow authors spread is just, we're all in this together. And I don't mean by that just COVID-19 and then we're all struggling, but everything. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's very important. Like you said, it's, it's something that we forget nowadays, I think. Yeah, when you're mission driven, then it doesn't really matter how we get the job done. Uh, I've been in the literacy space. It's one of my passions. Um, I've been the executive director of a, a nonprofit in Philadelphia that uh, was responsible for getting children on grade level reading by third grade. Uh, I didn't care how that got done. There are 90, you know, if you want to call them competitors, people looked at it as we had 90 competitors. No, we had 90 partners, Right. <laughs> you know? Right. 
Right. I mean, so we're all in this together to kind of figure it out because the mission is greater than any one individual. And sometimes that means that, you know, you have to adjust or change direction because you're not, maybe your piece isn't valid anymore. And that, and that's okay too. It's just, there are bigger discussions that have to be had. And I think, I think you said it best. Thank you. So tell me about those two projects you have going on. I saw them a little bit on your website. There, it looks like they're still in sketch form, if I'm not mistaken, at least one of them. Yeah. Tell me a little more. So one of them, so the, I'll start with the one that's due out in August. So my, my youngest, she's five and she's going to be starting kindergarten. And um, she is a, uh, you know, I always call her, refer to her as an independent princess. She needs nobody. I have <laughs> one of those. I know what it's like. <laughs> And I, I absolutely love it. Uh, but I know, it, you know, as I started this process back, probably like um, December, and the idea came to me, just a little bit different of a, of a first day book of how a little girl who's very independent will tackle her first day of kindergarten. Interestingly, I'm actually doing a complete, that's why it's taken a little bit. This whole thing has me reevaluating even again what her first day of kindergarten will look like, right? It will possibly be very different from what I imagined an independent princess would do uh, back in December. So I'm, I'm just about where it needs to be to start to get it into its final stages. Uh, but it's been tough because like, I've been really redoing major revisions, major illustration revisions on this and um, I'm good. I think we're going to have it on August 1st, but it will look very different. I'm going to blend in a lot of the content related to some of the new guidelines and recommendations that are going to happen for our elementary school kids. I'm going to also try to make a plea that not everything should be changed, <laughs> you know, that we should keep a little bit of what kindergarten should look like. And that's going to be the real storyline with that book. And it's called Lady P's first day, and that's what I call my daughter, Lady P. And, uh, you know, it's about her and her new friends and her new teacher and the new way we're going to look at kindergarten. Uh, so I'm excited about to get that out into the hands right before, before school starts in the fall. It's funny how you said, you know, I work for a school. I do admissions, and I work with the teachers and the head of school. And we sit down every day um, virtually, and we talk about what today, what do we think it would look like in September? And, you know, that changes. In fact, today in New York, they just released summer yeah. camp guidelines. And if you look at them, it's tr a drastic change from what children are used to. So I'm sure that that uncertainty, um, it might be, you know, must be quite overwhelming to kind of have a book that falls in line with what they're expecting. Um, but as a dad, I'm sure you hope that there is some sort of normalcy that continues because I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm seeing my children are missing that interaction and that social aspect. How are your children doing during this time? Another, so something that I, my, my consulting business has to do with um, performance and mental well-being of athletes. Uh, another hat that I wear is I coach college soccer. Cool. So I, coach, I coach, yes. And uh, it's, I've been coaching for 20 years. So I do a lot in this space also with mental well-being and pre being prepared. Uh, you said it again, very correctly. There's a lot to consider about the social and emotional well-being of children during this time. Um, I'm glad to see that there are many in different spaces realizing that we have to be respectful of the science. It's not about that. We have to be respectful of uh, health conditions. It's, it's not about that. But I think another seat at the table that might have been missed early on was the mental health professionals really discussing and really talking about what, what true grief looks like when you remove people from each other, when you isolate people for a long period of time. We can't be naive to think that these things aren't in addition to some of the science uh, with COVID-19. They, they're just as important. So I'm glad that teachers, educators, counselors, therapists, psychologists, scientists are starting to sit down together in dialogue. And hopefully, um, you know, we keep using words like normalcy and, you know, uh, you know, return back to normal and all these things. But the reality of it is we have to, we have to get back to social interacting. We have to get back to children at the playground. Uh, there's, you know, children are observational learners. So even from that standpoint of learning from what they're observing each other doing, taking that piece away 
it's just, it's not something that I think that we can negotiate with. So my children, we've been respectful. We've followed the guidelines. We wear our masks. We practice social distance. Uh, where we live, we are now in a, what we would call a yellow phase. So small groups are getting, you know, returning back to getting together. Restaurants are starting to open up outside. Um, and we're hoping, you know, for sports and camps. I was actually on a call just before I took this call with uh, my son attends a camp, an over uh, overnight camp, uh, away camp in Maine. And they said, and, and I agree with them to some degree, they have decided to cancel camp because they don't believe they will be able to serve their mission. And uh, I, I respect that because there's, there's a whole philosophy related to that camp that, will, that they won't be able to serve based upon the guidelines. So I'm hoping by September, some of these things, um, we're, we, we have a better understanding. We have figured out and come to some solutions. Uh, I'm very optimistic. I'm seeing a lot of positivity and I'm seeing a lot of, in the beginning, I just don't think we had the right, I, I'm a firm believer that have all the minds, right? The psychologists, the teachers, the educators, the firefighters, the nurses, the lawyers, everybody needs to be at the table discussing, not just one group, because then you're going to see, a, you might get a blind spot, right? That you didn't anticipate. I love that. So during this time, what books have you been reading with the kids besides the books that you've written? Oh my goodness. Uh, we have, I mean, we have a library of over 500, uh, at least 500, maybe a thousand children's books. They're all over the house. I love them everywhere. I love when I'm like, you know, I, I step out of bed and I just like trip over them and I don't get, I don't get mad. I love it. Uh, we are big. I'm me personally. I just started introducing uh, my kids to authors that I read when I was younger. I'm a big Shel Stevenson fan. Uh, Where the sidewalk ends, light in the attic, uh, the Giving Tree, those types of books where there's a positivity and there's a message. I always love the way he wrote for children. He was always creative. He, his word usage and uh, his uh, you could even see a layer of some sarcasm and contemporary issues laced in there. So I've been, you know, introducing them to those types of books. Uh, I love Jerry Spinelli. And then have your, your classics, you know, Berenstein, for my daughter, Berenstein Bears, Dr. Seuss. Uh, they are staples in, uh, in children's literacy. But we'll pick up anything, you know. Uh, I don't turn anything down. I've also transitioned the kids. I, I like physical books. And um, I sold out of all my, I only had to start with 500 physical books and they were gone immediately. I have another thousand coming in. Uh, they've been delayed because of everything that's been going on. Uh, but I've also, you know, I like the eBooks, you know, as an eBook author, you know, and on a, you know, on an iPad or on a Kindle, having them, you know, kind of flip through and try different types of books, you know, with Kindle Unlimited and some of the programs out there, there's opportunities to see thousands of free different, you know, free options for, for books. And there's also tons of websites that I've used uh, that are free, you know, freebooks.com, uh, freekidsbooks.com. They post two or three different types of books a, a day for children to kind of, um, you know, to, to look at. So it's funny, Shel Silverstein has always been one of my favorites. I introduced him to my daughter. My daughter is going to second grade. So I introduced him to my daughter, Light in the Attic, where the sidewalk ends. And funny enough, today on our Facebook page, we posted a piece of trivia that The Giving Tree almost didn't get published because editors didn't think there was an audience for it, which is crazy because it is such a staple, right? In children's lives, you get to learn about that. That was like a crazy thing for us to find. What In one sentence, how can you frame up as a dad, as an author who tackled the subject, what advice can you give kids uh, to give parents who might think like, you know what, they don't need to know. Let them just know to stay home and I'll take care of them. Let them not know. For me as a parent, I always want my children to hear it from me right? So take a look at the book. If it's not for you, it's not for you. If it is for you and you, because I think it's actually, even though it's addressed towards children, uh, I've been told by adults uh, that they enjoyed it because it's quick, it's light, and it's very topical. So if those, if that applies to you, then be open to the space of providing it to your children. We're just here as authors to provide you some resources so you can create the space to have a bigger conversation. We shouldn't be, the authors aren't looking to be the only ones in the conversation. And now my second question to you is for anyone who's listening who might want to become a writer and author, what advice can you give them as someone who has a book that's out, has some books in the works, what can you share with them? 
get started. Just do it. Just do it. I think I've also been, I, fall, I have fallen into that fatal uh, trap of, it's not good enough. I'm not sure. Let me wait a little bit. Let me keep, keep tweaking. Put it out there. Put it out there. You'll get, listen, their first one, it, your first, they, they say that, right? Your first at bat might not be a home run. It's okay, right? But you're going to learn. You're going to take it. You're going to learn from it. So I would say move forward. If this is something that you want to do and something that you believe very strongly in, put it out there into the universe and let's see what happens. Create some action around your project. That's it. I love that. I mean, great steps. I think also for us, when we started our nonprofit, we didn't intend to start a nonprofit. We were just doing something in the school for Hindi uh, and it kind of grew. And we just kind of, you know, we called each other and we're like, should we just, just dive in, just see what happens? And we just blindly, completely blindly, just dive right in. Um, and I think that's great um, words of advice. My final question for you is, can you think of a children's book quote, something you read when you were a child or to your children that really has stuck with you, that's resonated, that you could share with us? Well, you know, I think it's very timely, but uh, I love I love Dr. Seuss. You can't go wrong with Dr. Seuss. And uh, I think it's very important right now is uh, in Horton Hears a Who, uh, he says, a person is a person no matter how small, right? And uh, I think that that's important because we're all in this together. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your race, your religion, or what you believe in, your creed. It doesn't matter. We are in this together. We're all Americans. We're all uh, God's people. And if we can work in some way to just understand that we all provide some type of uh, something good to the universe, let's just, let's just figure it out together. And I love what Horton says. And I love Dr. Seuss's spin on it. And uh, yeah, that, would be, that would be it. Um, so where can our listeners find you? Tell us your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Tell us a little bit about where they could find your info. To keep everything simple, just at my website, I, all my stuff is there, uh, my projects, my consulting, uh, the books, new books, uh, and my social media. It's drdefinis.com, D-R-D-E-F-I-N-I-S, drdefinis.com. Everything is there. The book is on Amazon. If you type in my name, you'll find me on Twitter and on Facebook. And uh, connect, you know, just become a community with me. I, you know, I'm probably one of the odd authors where I'm not really like pitching you a book to buy. If you want to buy, buy. If you don't, don't. If you want to, there's a million ways to find it for free. I'll show you how to get it for free. So as long as you're, you know, as long as you're, uh, you're being a positive force, uh, you know, just connect. It's fine. I love that. I love the term being a positive force. I think again, like you and I have spoken about, it's something that people just have lost sight of. And listen, there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and fear and everyone kind of just checked out mentally in one way or another, even though everyone's trying to find their balance, we're, we're struggling. I think everyone, no one is having a grand old time, you know, dealing with everything. But if you are a positive force and you feel that you can make a change, make an impact, I think that's all that it takes just to get started. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thanks. You're awesome. Take care. 